Hi, I wanted to provide a brief introduction to Eugene Bennett's Web of Matter, and concentrating particularly on the first chapter, which sets up the terms for a lot of the rest of the book and how it develops. So, one of the things Bennett seems to be interested in is bringing vitality to matter, uh, or what she calls a thing power, or restoring a wildness. Would also be termed a uh, return to wonder. And she's written on uh, issues of wonder in the Enlightenment and uh, modernism in the past. And it's something a number of uh, thinkers are investigating. That is, um, if the Enlightenment has a sense of reason and control, how uh, does that sense of mastery, what slips through from that mastery? That is, how does the mastery? create certain blind spots, um, and how can we enter into those other, uh, into other ways of thinking that would open up what in an enlightenment system or a reason system of mastery um, is a blind spot. So how can we open up these other avenues? Uh, she sees this wildness as that which is outside, that which cannot be represented or comprehended. <laughs> Comprehension has the word prehension, that is how could something that is grasped. So uh, a wildness would be that which can't be grasped, that which can't be represented. Um, we don't have access to it, to it directly then uh, by definition. So instead we have to approach it obliquely and this is often done through imagination, through art, and through fiction. So some of the powers of um, literature and art are the ability to open up this wildness or this thing power in ways that uh, rational thought sometimes doesn't have access to by definition. Um, in the sort of opening she exa example she gives, uh, she sees on the street a sort of a dead rat, some plastic and some wood that together create an assembly uh, that is uh, vital and what she says calls, uh, it issued a call. In other words, um, it spoke in a language that is unfamiliar and that we can't fully comprehend, but um, opened up her sensibilities and caused her to notice. Uh, this sort of collection of wrapped plastic wood, she calls an assemblage, here using a term um, from, mainly from Deleuze and Guattari, uh, from these philosophers, we might think of as an ecology. Um, an assemblage uh, is the idea that one object or one thing, not an object, one entity can be linked to another entity, can be linked to another, and it's the unique constellation or linking that provides a, uh, a unique ecology. That's often whole in itself, even without humans, and that we just happen to enter into and then notice. Um, an example of that might be uh, Otto Leopold's Thinking Like a Mountain. And you can Google Thinking Like a Mountain to get some of the details of Leopold's understanding of this, but briefly he uh, gives an example in which he had seen a wolf die and uh, he recalls how wolves are sort of demonized and hunted down, um, almost eradicated. But in the eradication of wolves then, the deer population increases because there are primary predators around anymore. With the deer population increasing, uh, they tend to eat much more, and they eat the ground scrub that then causes, uh, because that's not there, it causes erosion to the mountain. And so Leopold's idea of thinking like a mountain is we have to think of a whole ecology, that the wolf is important to main, help maintain the right balance in a deer population that then allows the mountain to thrive and grow, or to thrive and to maintain a certain stable ecosystem. Uh, 
Um, so that might be an example of an assemblage in an ecology. What Gene Bennett is after then is to think of these entities not as singular objects. Um, it's not interested in a human object relationship. She uses other language. Instead, she talks about Latour's term, the actant. So uh, a thing can act. Uh, Bennett likes the term agent. Agent often comes with um, uh, a uh, certain terminology of moral intentionality. And that can be a problem in using the term agent. But she says that really what she's interested in is flattening and undoing hierarchies. So she's not interested in, well, there are humans who have moral agency and below that are objects that, uh, that don't have agency and don't have standing in the world, etc. Instead, she wants to create this flat plane um, of what, using Adorno, another philosopher's term, it, she calls non-identity. Non-identity is objects do not go into their concepts without a remainder, is what she says. Now, what does that mean? Objects do not go into their concepts without remainder. Well, basically, um, that a thing, in order to be an object, other aspects of its thingness get reduced or shuffled off. And in doing so, uh, they, they create a remainder. So in other words, when we think of an object, what we've done is we've reduced the fullness or the full ecology of an object or of an assemblage um, by simply quartering, quartering it off into a comprehensible object, prehensible, something that can be grasped and understood. So instead, she wants to create this exercise by which we imagine uh, what you might call like a flat ontology, which is an equivalence among all things, um, so that there's not this hierarchy. And in that equivalence, then, creating assemblages, or constellations, by which we could imagine how different things might interact. Now, um, she creates a series of exercises by which to help us uh, get uh, some insight into these constellations. And first is to is developing concepts, the concept of non-identity, or what we call, might call vibrant matter, um, or thing power. Next is uh, to have what she calls utopian imagination. That is to see where our normal way of thinking has blind spots and create an active, vital materiality rather than objects for use. So a utopian imagination uh, might involve art or literature or other ways of an imagining of vitality that we can't necessarily rep easily represent or see. And then finally, a playfulness to uh, open up these new possibilities of assemblages. Um, one example of this, I think, is Delillo's white noise, where uh, the white noise uh, objects all around, and machinery, etc., really uh, call to the humans, and uh, the humans are co-opted in the stories of these objects. So, altogether then, uh, vibrant matter is a way of trying to open up uh, to, to move away from the concept of object and instead to create a new concept of things or vitality of matter that opens up what's possible in a non-human world and non-human world.